journey to our passage. Um, and uh, there's a reason for that. Um, we've been doing a great deal with John the Baptist, and that will again continue next week. Last week, I talked about how John did his best to point to Jesus. That was his role, pointing to Jesus. Today, however, we have John baptizing Jesus. Now, if you've gone to church for any length of time, you have seen baptism. Many of you probably have been baptized. What is baptism? I mean, that seems like a simple question. Right? Well, baptism, or what some call ritual washing, or ritual purification, is not unique to Christianity. Muslims have a washing ceremony. They do every single morning when they get up. They wash their nose, they wash their hands, they wash specific things before they pray. In the Baha'i faith, they also wash before prayer. And if you go to Jerusalem today, right below the Wailing Wall, really neat archaeological exhibit down there. And they have, underground, these huge baths. And the idea was, is anyone that went to the temple had to go and bathe themselves before they went to the temple. And you go, well, I can read about people doing that. <laughs> but it's true, they would go down to what they call mikvahs, and then they would go up to the temple. Um, both Hindus and Shintus have rituals that they perform, which wash away sins, when in 12 years Hindus celebrate the Kumbha Mela, or the washing of the Ganges River. You may have seen this on TV, literally. Millions of people go into the river. Um, Shintos also perform a type of baptism to wash away their sins during the 11th day of the month. So ritual washing is not new to those who are watching what John is doing. But John is doing something unique. And later, John also does something that's unique in that he baptizes. Both are baptized. And this is creating what we understand as our sacrament of baptism. So today we're going to look at how, at these two baptisms, at how baptism of John and baptism of Jesus are really two separate baptisms. We're also going to look at some important things, such as the words repentance, the words fire, and the words Holy Spirit. Repentance, fire, and the Holy Spirit. So let's first start with repentance. Unlike Shintos and the Hindus and Christian baptism, John's baptism is not a baptism that is about washing away sins. John's baptism is a baptism of preparation. And in it, John called it a baptism of repentance. What's repentance? Well, Josephus defined it as way. Repentance is an act where those who have begun to hate their errors and their sins have determined to set out on a different course of life. You hear that? So it's acknowledging we have sins, and we're going to do something different. So it embraces the, the sin, it recognizes sin. And it says that we're going to be doing something differently. Now, when John chastises the Sadducees and the Pharisees, he's realizing that they're going to come and see him, and they may even get baptized, but they're not going to do anything different. Their lives will not have been changed. Why? Well, funny enough, and I hate to say it this way, but they don't think that they're sinners. Not unusual in our world today that people think that they are totally sinless, but also that they don't think that they've been doing anything that needs to be changed. They go to the temple, they do what they're supposed to do, they follow the rules, their lives are not going to be changed. And so he calls them this brood of vipers, bear fruit worthy of repentance. So the baptism for both John and Jesus is, is a transformation. The ancient Greeks had two, two different words for immersing something in water. Um, one was bacto. And bacto simply means you dip it, right? And they talked about this, the ancient Greeks, in this recipe, funny enough, that's an interesting thing, the ancient recipe, for pickles, right? And you were supposed to dip 
the pickle or the, the cucumber in boiling water, and then you were to baptize it or baptizo in a vinegar solution. Right? The first one just kind of cleaned it off. The second one literally changed the cucumber into a pickle. It was, it was, you couldn't back that up. You couldn't say, oh, now we're going to make it back into a cucumber. Maybe somebody in Silicon Valley can try to figure out how to do that. <laughs> but, but it really is almost totally impossible. So the baptism of repentance transforms the old and it creates something new. Um, it also acknowledges the sin. Now, does anyone see anything wrong with what's going on? A baptism that transforms, a baptism that admits your sin, a baptism that sets you out in a different direction, and here's Jesus. What do we know about Jesus? He is not sinful. He can't be sinful. Otherwise, he wouldn't be Jesus. Right? That's the whole idea. So why on earth is he going to get baptized? And that's a really good question. Um, so we have to look at what Jesus is baptized in. So we're going to, instead of answering that question right away, we're going to kind of come back around to it. I'm going to start with what Jesus' baptism is supposed to be. John talks about Jesus' baptism very specifically. He says in verses 11 and 12 that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he goes on to say his winnowing fork in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will build with unquenchable fire. What a wonderful little picture. Now, what have we heard about Jesus up until this time? <clears throat> up until this time, he was a little baby in a manger, in a sense. Right? Pure is the dread of snow. If you've read, read, read the book of Luke, he was in the temple, and he was teaching, he was preaching a little bit. Right? He was not a guy who was going to bring out a blowtorch. This is a totally new picture of Jesus. But it does show us that the Messiah, that Jesus himself, is a very powerful figure. Not only is he powerful, but he's able to literally command the Holy Spirit. So what is John saying? If you approach, if you approach Jesus, you better be careful. Baptizo has, I told you the, the rest of the part, baptizo also means to sink a ship. It means to destroy a ship. It, it's used to destroy something. Um, so perhaps the, the baptism that Jesus is going to perform is a baptism of destruction. But later on, in Luke 9, 55, Jesus, he's with two disciples, James and John, and they had had a bad day. And they wanted Jesus to call down fire on this city and these people and get rid of them. And of course, John turned, Jesus turned to them and rebuked them. He had not come to condemn the world, but to save the world, right? So Jesus' baptism was not a baptism of destruction. But there are other places in the Old Testament where, where baptism is used as a form of cleansing, where fire specifically is used as a form of cleansing. Numbers 31, 23. Everything that may abide the fire, you shall make it go through the fire, and it shall be clean. So in this way, the destruction need kind of like be the destruction of germs. Destruction of things that are difficult, or, or horrible, or problematic. In other parts of the Old Testament, God calls fire down to anoint certain areas. To anoint, for instance, the Temple Mount. And to show himself as being holy. So, repentance means that we need to change the way we act. And that Jesus' baptism was less about judgment. And more about burning off that which is problematic to us. It destroys, but it also cleans, it, it heals, it validates, it welcomes. So first, the baptism of repentance. Second, the baptism of fire. Third, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So why does Jesus need to be baptized? 
In fact, it's interesting because just this simple act could totally derail Jesus' ministry. If everyone's saying he's sinless, we say, well, no, we saw him get baptized. So this is the first time we have actually seen Jesus in the flesh since he was 12 and in the temple. 18 years of life, that's a long time, in total silence. We do not know what Jesus was doing in those 18 years. We can hypothesize, um, but if he did preach, if he did teach, if he did lead or heal, we don't have any record of it. So, what perhaps is going on here, this concept of righteousness, is, is that Jesus has been going in a certain direction, and now he actually needs to claim his call. He actually needs to start healing and teaching. In that sense, he is going in a different direction. He is taking up the calling that he's always had. Before I became a pastor, I was in Christian radio and uh, I was doing computer texting. It's not that those things were problematic, bad, or evil, but they weren't what I was called to. I had to wait until the time was right. My case paying off my student debt. <laughs> so I could go and do what I felt like I needed to do. And who knows what Jesus was waiting for. But it was, in a sense, a change, in a sense, that his repentance was going in a new direction. It wasn't that he had sinned, necessarily, although there are some ancient theologians that say maybe he did. Most, 99% of theologians would say he wasn't. So that purpose of ministry was always percolating below the surface, but at this moment it kind of comes out. And Jesus doesn't go on a long explanation to explain why he was baptized. He just says it is to fulfill all righteousness. And righteousness is simply the doctrine concerning the way in which we, as human beings, can get into a state which God wants us to be in. To get in a way that God says, you're doing well. Good and faithful servant, you're headed in the right direction. Jesus didn't need to die in his sins, but that is just to show God's righteousness. And to be an example to all of us, that it's not about doing what you feel needs to be done. Sometimes God calls you to something and you don't know why you've been called. Sometimes God calls you to things and it doesn't make any sense. Friends, you might not understand why you have to take communion or why communion is a part of it. You just know it's a good thing to do, and so you do it. And that's exactly how God operates. We don't always need to understand why we're supposed to do or why we're doing what we're doing. We just know that it's right, that it's moral, that it is to fulfill all righteousness. But this is very hard, and there are many in the world that will not buy into it. They have to have a reason and a fact for doing anything. But we as Christians know, even when we don't feel it, we know Christ is there. We know even when our prayers are being unanswered, God is still there. We know even when we're in the midst of depression and we don't feel God at all, He is with us at that moment. This is what faith is all about. It's not about some scientific principle where A plus B equals C. It's about saying, we don't know. And Jesus himself was doing the exact same thing. I don't know. All I know is this is what God wants me to do. John's baptism in water had been a baptism of repentance. Jesus was bringing that baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, it would enable his disciples not only to follow Christ, but to live in his love, to live in his faith to triumph over them. This is the Christ we follow, and we have a new beginning. Let me read Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him, baptized into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from death to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This life, this fire of God, this means of purifying each person who accepts Christ as his Savior. 
So through your baptism, you have been welcomed the Holy Spirit into your life. And that Holy Spirit comes in you as a pilot light. And that pilot light helps to run your life. Even if you don't hear it, even if you don't understand it, even if you can't do a, a scan on a computer to detect it, we know it's there. So, righteousness comes by faith, and Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And what happened was is that the Spirit of God descended on Christ that moment, and we have this wonderful picture, and God says, out of the clouds, you are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. I am pleased because you did something that didn't make any sense. And God and Jesus would do that for the rest of his life. Since baptism is part of Christ's body, we are generated into baptism, we are renewed, we are forgiven. Baptism makes us a new creature, a child of God, a member of Christ's body, adopted as God's. Through God, we have direct access to the Spirit, free from condemnation, established. We, each one of us, are anointed, a citizen of heaven, seated with Christ in the heavenly realm protected from the devil. And because of Christ, you can embody not a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. And you can do all this through Christ, who strengthens you. Jesus reminds us all that he will never do this, nor forsake us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your Son and we realize that we can't achieve righteousness through our own efforts, but that it is a gift sent into our hearts through faith. Help us to keep that faith and trust in you even when your will does not seem to make sense. In Jesus' name we pray.